following podcast may contain spoilers, profanity, and views or opinions that may not be representative of the author's intent of the articles discussed. We don't always take ourselves or the subject matter seriously either. Listener discretion is advised. The following is a Galactic Network podcast. All right, so welcome to the Alien Invasion number 252, recorded on Monday, a Monday, a weird Monday recording, November 26th, 2018. My name's Dave Nelson. That guy's Brad Ludwig. Hey, Brad. Hey. All right. On this episode, I think I I said all right twice. All right. All right, all right. All right. (laughs) On this episode, we'll be doing a detailed and careful examination of the 1977 masterpiece of movie making, Starship Invasions. Starring with a straight face. <laughs> starring Robert Vaughn as Professor Alan Duncan. And the great late, the late great Christopher Lee as Captain Ramses. So uh before we get into this, first impressions, Brad, or just give me a general overview of your impressions of this film. It reeked of the 70s. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> and not the good 70s of, like, Star Wars. And it's funny because it came out the same year. Yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> not even close to the same thing. So the plot summary goes as follows. Starship Invasions is a 1977 Canadian science fiction film. I didn't know it was Canadian. Uh, Directed, produced, and written by Ed Hunt and filmed in Toronto, Ontario, is released in the UK as Project Genocide. I like that better. It it sounds so horrendously sinister when you use the word genocide. Mm. So I can see why they didn't use it in the States. Project Genocide. Genocide. <laughs> I'm going to call my project Genocide. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see me, but I'm doing the old evil hand thing. The evil <laughs> You know, the... You twiddle your fingers and... <laughs> yeah, yes. It's like if somebody doesn't have a handlebar mustache to twirl, they do the finger thing. Yes. It's almost <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> same thing exactly. Okay, so Captain Ramses and his legion of winged serpent brigade are out to claim Earth for their dying race. Out to save Earth is an alien guard patrol located in the Bermuda Triangle, which I thought was interesting. We've talked about submersed, like, alien bases under the water before. I really get the feeling that... I'm trying to remember when Donakin's book was released originally. Uh, He did Chariots of the Gods. See, that's the re-release is 1999. That had to be in the 70s. Oh, that's the 50th anniversary edition. Good God. Oh, okay. So it was even earlier than the 70s. Ah, there we go. 1968 is when that book was released. So I, some of the things, because I've read most of chariots of the gods and some of the things that they posit in the book appear in the film. Okay. So I kind of get that feeling that the the writers use some of the information there to, uh, to put into their mythos. So they were inspired by ch- the information in chariots of the gods. That's my gut feeling. Okay. Let me continue with the s- summary of the film. LOR leaders warn Ramses that he's breaking galactic treaty rules. Not damn Ramses. The alien villain responds by launching an invasion which telepathically drives Earthlings to suicide. The LOR implore UFO expert Professor Duncan to help them. Eventually, the two alien forces battle. Will the Earth be saved? Question mark. All right, so that is the just quick summary of the film. And I'm going to go and say something real quick 
I think I have this included in the weirdness at the end. But um, the space, the fight, the battle sequence towards the end of the film, it seemed longer than it really had to be. Did you sense that when you watched it? Yeah, I, I, a lot of the film felt longer than it had to be. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. You know what? A person should take this film and re-edit it. You know, one of those people on YouTube that has way too much time in their hands, just take this film and take out all the boring long parts and compact it, and I bet you it's going to be twice as good. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. I have no idea. Maybe there's no save no, in this film. I don't think you're wrong at all. Okay. All right. Follow this Galactic Network podcast on Twitter, like our Facebook page, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Find us by searching for Galactic Network on all the major social networks or click on the icons at GNCast.com. Let's uh, get into our questions segment. These are questions that we have that we ask of every film that we review, and they're just basic stuff. For example, what type of alien were they? And that's a tough question. Because yeah. there was a couple of alien races involved in this film, wasn't there? Yes. Are you trying to think back? No, I was trying to, because I know of the two, and I couldn't remember if there was a third, but there, there really wasn't. It was the the humanoids, uh, the Christopher Lee's uh, race. The bad guys. Yeah. And then... That design was just ridiculous. I'm sorry. That serpent. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Anyways, uh, but then like the uh, the League of Races was only represented by one race. It looked like. Yeah. Well, and then some <laughs> some robots or a a robot. You know, those robots looked a lot like. And by robots, I mean it looked like they were wearing like. A welding helmet on steroids, like if you if a welding helmet and a deep sea diving bell, you know, like the suit, yeah. like the the helmet had a baby, it would be it would have been that. But I'm pretty sure that when I used to watch, you remember uh, Saturday at the Bijou on PBS? Yes, I we do. Were... Yeah, it, it, they played old old movies. Yes, and they played the Flash Gordon serials. And one of them, they had that, I swear to God, it's that same helmet thing that their their robots wore. Well, it might have been like in a storage room somewhere on, on the uh, in the film studio lot or whatever. And they might have reused the same or, you know, they were inspired by that same design. Uh, you possibly, yeah. possibly. But when I saw that, I'm like, oh, Flash Gordon <laughs> was the first thing I thought of with the robots. I want to go back to the League of Races. There was actually two separate, besides the uh, Christopher Lee race, there was mm -hmm. two other, because there was the ones with the weird shaped heads, right? Yeah. But then there was also humanoid looking ones that worked with, like worked alongside them, it seemed. Do you remember that? Yeah, the like the, the redhead that... Um was told not to interfere and then was gunned down for her troubles later on. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I kind of felt like they were an offshoot of uh, Christopher Lee's race. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, didn't really count them as a separate one. You know what I'm saying? But then there was like the, the workers or the crewmen on that ship that were wearing helmets because the budget didn't afford makeup for all the people. <laughs> Yes. Okay, you got me. Let's. Got uh, me. We need more people in this film, but we can't afford the makeup, so let's just put helmets on them. Yeah, we'll, we'll take care of it right there. That's actually pretty ingenious. You will be is issued headgear. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what was the reason for their invasion? Because their fancy red dot watch told them it was time to. Oh, they're 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 yeah. It, Really, their the actual explanation was their son was going to go like supernova or something, right? Yes, and the it was their little watch, and it it looked like a square faced digital watch that only had one red LED, and mm -hmm. that was it. Yep. And the 
timing on the watch was set to coincide with the destruction of their planet and the light would get bigger uh, the closer it got to the destruction of their planet. So, so they were kind of on a timetable to basically rid the earth of all human inhabitants. Uh, so they had a place to run to. They could have just brought other people in and then fought the humans later. That would have actually saved their race, right? There has to be conflict. So uh, <laughs> two, if you're going to have conflict, you want to make sure you have a winged serpent on your costume. Yes. So... Uh, yeah, there was no other way for them. The question is, we don't know how many people were left on their planet. Um, you know, could they have made offshoot pyramids <laughs> in the Bermuda Triangle to house them? Or, or how would that have all worked? And, uh... You know, there didn't seem to be really a plan given to the whole thing. They could, so. have, they could have found a isolated place on the Earth and just uh, camped out there. That's what I was thinking. I, you know, yeah, possibly it's a crazy and, idea. Yeah. All right. So the next question is: What type of technology did they possess, or by what means did they travel the cosmos? Oh, what did they call it? Like um, reversible electromagnetism? Yeah, there was magnets involved. I know that. Yeah. How do they work? I don't remember. Sorry. I don't <laughs> <Sorry>. remember. <laughs> I watched this film two weeks ago. So... No, 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 no. no. I, that was kind of a internet meme. Magnets, how do they work? Oh, okay. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. No, that's I'm cool. not as cool as you, Brad. Sorry. No, it wasn't even uh, all that funny. So don't <laughs> feel bad for uh, not chuckling. <laughs> Their technology reminded me of Star Trek technology. Their their bridge on their ships actually reminded me of the Starship Enterprise because they had that thing that they looked in, like Spock's, you know, on the original series. Oh, yeah, the viewfinder yeah. sort of a thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I could see that. Did they have ray guns? I forget. Yes, they okay. had – because the – the only female on that ship. <laughs> yeah, where are all the women at? Uh, yeah, I I don't know. So she had like a pistol. Oh, that's right. Like a smaller gun. In order for her to shoot it, she had to crouch down like one of the Charlie's Angels, take a pose, and then pew! Um, it was the most inefficient gun I've ever seen if that's what she had to do to make it fire because by god every time she fired it she had to do that <laughs> um maybe that's how the mechanism worked you have to you had to pose a certain way <laughs> in order for it to function properly it's, it's, it's the only way it'll work uh, can you think of any other technology that you saw that uh, kind of caught your eye their memory eraser oh, the yeah. uh cylinder that they just press to the side of your head and you'd forget stuff and they also use that to kind of wire the humans into or that one human the one that knew about computers and stuff yeah into their system to 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 was it to fly the ship or was it to he was doing well uh robert vaughn had the astronomy background so he knew the weights of the planets yep and then the computer dude that had had the heart attack once before that we find out right before stuff really starts to get real. <laughs> uh, he did the calculation. So he had his little LED calculator that he was poking away at uh, to do the calculations for the aliens, which if you are navigating the ship and they weren't constantly at the controls. So I would think that computer functionality was there. Mm -hmm. Why didn't they just, you know, uh, plug the data from, from the astronomer, from Robert Vaughn's character, Dr. Duncan, and just plug it in that way. I mean, it's like they had a chain of humans. It's like, we can't be bothered to do this. You humans, you do this. And, and then we'll, we'll, you know, it's just like they needed to give. They, they needed a way to get the humans into the story. Because it was really, it was really a story about one alien race fighting the other. Yes. And Duncan definitely had a place, but the computer dude, it was like he was mocking 
Dr. Duncan earlier for his career choice and told him that he was basically committing career suicide, as it were. And then when the aliens tap Dr. Duncan and they're like, oh, we got computer problems. It, he's like, I know a guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then they pick him up. And then I, I just wanted to have Duncan have that. I told you so <laughs> moment. <laughs> and, you know, it was like his, his only purpose on the ship is basically to have his nose rubbed into how wrong he was. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, that's really kind of what it felt like. Mm -hmm. So, um, what was the other thing I was thinking about? Oh, okay. Um, it's amazing that they had to find humans to help them with their mission. It's like they didn't have enough talented people of their own to figure out what to do or figure things out or was there an explanation behind that i forget oh they lost the people in the in the attack so yeah okay so the basically their base had been overrun by the winged serpent society or the legion of the uh, winged serpent uh, christopher lee's crew so and they wiped out all the robots and wiped out all the al other aliens that were in there. Mm -hmm. And I can't, there were only four UFOs. One was lost early. There was the one they were in. So yeah, they only had one. I can't remember what happened to the third UFO Okay. that they had. So yeah, they were, their crew was decimated. So, I mean, they basically had no choice but to fall back on Duncan. Okay, next question. If there's a conflict, who won and how do they do it? Well, we kind of talked about this already, how they did it. The conflict was the aliens that were protecting the Earth were at in conflict with the aliens that wanted to invade the Earth and kill all the humans. That's the conflict. Yes. There's also the, the fact that like every evil, villainous race, they let their, um, their, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Hubris. Hubris, yes. That's exactly the word I was looking for. They let their hubris get in the way and actually led to their undoing. Absolutely. You know, we have been together so long that you can go, I, uh, uh, like, oh, I know exactly what you're looking for. Hubris, that's the word. Yeah, we're, we're like one brain, Brad. <laughs> we share a yeah. brain now. Yeah. That's how it works. Thank God, because on our own, we're screwed. We oh, don't, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what moral and or phil philosophical issues were dealt with here? It's always easier to ask first. <laughs> And really, yeah. Had they had they shown up and went, yeah, uh, aliens are real. We need a place to crash because our planet is uh, about to explode. Can can you help a brother out? Yeah. Also, and, the moral issue is let's kill all the humans. That's that's some that's a moral area of of uh, not a good place to be. Serious grayness there. Yes, yeah. not, not even grayness. <laughs> it's a very very. Well, you know, for them, no, it was there. There was no gray there. It was like uh, kill or be killed. Yeah, I mean, and alien and and the humans, maybe they were the equivalent of like sheep or cattle to them, so they didn't have as much of a moral issue as another more friendly or more uh, moral race than these guys were. Well, and they kind of allude to it when the female alien from the league of races talks to dr duncan you know he asked her you know what's your society like and she's like dude i can't tell you <laughs> because you're an unstable primitive race <laughs> but tell you what we built we built the pyramid of giza once you figure all that out you'll figure out how we travel you'll figure out our society how it all works until then no, you get nothing. <laughs> so, you know, it really felt like their job was to... Well, actually, and Christopher Lee mentioned it too, because they tested that first car 
that first family mm-hmm. and genetically they said that they were divergent from humans. Okay. Cause he says specifically we need to wipe out our parent race so that we can take this planet. Ah, so they were a, um, a branch of the human race. They yes. were a tree, a tree and, branch. And I think, you know, the justification I feel that was used is, you know, these yokels don't even, you know, can't even manufacture a, a flying craft uh, worthy of space travel. Um, they really don't have a right to all the resources and stuff mm-hmm. they have here, and we can actually utilize it. Uh, so they really don't deserve to be here. So, I I forgot about that scene with the family, and I was thinking while that scene was taking place that they were freaking out, like they were overly oh, panicked. Boy. Yeah, about what was going on. Yep. And of course, I was thinking the there was a girl, right? They yes. had a daughter. She was all like loosey goosey back in in the back seat, like no seat belt. Oh no! The first family was the boy, the mother oh, and father. Okay. The, the Duncan had the daughter. Oh, that's right. All right. Okay. Final question: Were there any inspirations drawn from real real life or other fiction? Did this movie inspire others, or did um, others were were they inspired by others? I guess is what I'm trying to say. You know, like I mentioned, it really felt like they leaned on Donakin's uh, Chariots of the Gods for part of the story. So I think that the writers were inspired by that. Mm -hmm. I think they were inspired by Star Trek in the design of the ship, like not the outside, but the inside of the ship. Yeah, yep, I I would agree with that. It did kind of have that feel to it. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned... Flash Gordon with that robot, so maybe that was yep. an inspiration for them as well. Has this did this movie inspire other movies? After it? I'm gonna say Probably no. Probably not. I'm gonna say no because <laughs> it seemed like a throwback for the nineteen seventies. It it felt like a earlier film from an earlier decade that was kind of just a leftover that was was filmed in the 70s. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, it, it really did. Because you look at other things at that time, like Close Encounters of the Third Kind was about to come out. Um, Star Wars came out that same year. So there were some really... Oh, Alien came out um, around that period as well. So I think this was just like a leftover of what science fiction was. It was about to change. Science fiction was about to get a lot better. And this is just like the last gasp of kind of bad, cheesy, terrible special effects science fiction. You know, like you said, Star Wars had just come out or was about to. I can't recall where it fell in in time. And nobody really knew the profound impact that Star Wars would end up having even at that time. Yeah. So I think that time will not (laughs) look back upon this film very, very kindly. No. Um, And I didn't know anything about this film until I did some like Googling or I did uh, a search on YouTube. So that's, that's how forgettable. Yeah. People don't talk about this movie. And I, I believe the only reason why some people talk about it was because it was a movie on Mystery Science Theater 3000. Yes. And I was half tempted to find that version to watch <laughs> for this episode. It would make it more interesting, but you wouldn't see the whole thing cuz they don't no. they don't they, they never show the whole movie. That is correct. If you like this podcast, The Alien Invasion, and would love to support us in a very simple way, we ask that you go to gncasts.com slash support. That's G-N-C-A-S-T-S dot com slash support and click on the Patreon link. Uh, now with Patreon, we're just asking for a few dollars a month. It's not per episode, it's per month at one, three, and five dollar levels. And each level has its own perk. Like, you can get your name mentioned 
on our shows, not just this show, but all of our other podcasts that are part of the Galactic Network Network. You can get a whole message read and other perks, other other things that you'll get for your dollar, three dollar, five dollar a month support of the network. So again, go to gncasts.com slash support. Click on that Patreon link. And I believe we also have a link to our Amazon affiliate link on that page as well. So if you're going to be doing some shopping on Amazon, uh, click that link and support us that way as well. GNCasts.com slash support. And we thank you. All right, let's move into the weirdness section. These are some observations that we made of some oddities in the film. And uh, some of the ones that I I had, I put down here, or I, I noted, uh, it was very sexual. A lot, of, uh, a lot of sexual overtones and sexual activity going on. Wasn't there? Yeah. Kind of at the beginning when they grab that very first family because they wanted to grab the female. Oh, that's, that's, that's why I was thinking that. Okay. And they had, and she was stripped down to her bra and panties. Okay. And, and she's just sitting there fretting about, you know, what's going on rightfully. So, and uh, she was actually kind of resistant to their mind control techniques. And then they, really gave her the whammy so didn't they kidnap like a uh, a man and then they used the female alien or a female alien to try to like i don't know seduce or try to figure out his how his sexuality worked or something like that i remember him having like the the cylinder put to his head but i don't remember him getting it on with anybody no he didn't it just the woman came in and she was all sexy, and that was the the alien female. Okay. Yeah. Not not huh. the one. Yeah, it it was the one that was uh, with the evil aliens. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, my next one is they saved on makeup by putting hats on some of the aliens. I mentioned that earlier. Hats <laughs> on aliens. Oh, okay. The interior of the one race's ship was exactly the same as the interior of the other. Did you notice that? There were definite similarities. Absolutely. You know, and I, I kind of get the feeling that they built an entire ship, maybe like 270 degrees of it, and they filmed one side for the one race oh, yeah. and then changed the lighting and turned it to the other. Yeah, no, that's highly possible. Uh, to the other side, uh, because there were a lot of of similar elements. That's like on the original Star Trek series, where they would uh, another starship would come up, you know, come into the story, and it would be the same bridge as the Enterprise, just with slight changes. You know, like yeah, yep, a higher back chair for the captain's chair, or something like that. All right, so I mentioned a couple more of these. The uh, family's reaction in the in the car when they got abducted, or when the when the flying saucer showed up, uh, the ship interior reminded me of oh, reminded me of the old TARDIS design, sort of. Like sort of, it was like round, and the thing was like the a lot of controls were in the center of of the uh, the main yeah. bridge or whatever. You know, and. Uh... Thinking back to Forbidden Planet, that setup was the same there, too. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they got inspired by the Forbidden Planet. I, you know, that would not surprise me. Okay, and I have written down here finger guns. Was there something with their fingers being guns? Oh, oh, I know what it was. It was like they had this thing attached to their fingers that was the gun. That was kind of like... It had a wire on it, and it kind of went from their finger to their arm, I think. I believe. <laughs> pew, pew. Yeah. It was like a hose, like a water hose. <laughs> Do you have any weirdness that you uh, that you noticed or some oddities that you noticed? You know, the ray that was – or the, the beam that they used on the people of the Earth – is like the least efficient way to get rid of the population. You know what I'm saying? 
Because it's not like everybody tried to kill themselves. Yeah, it was hit or miss. It was very hit or miss. And, you know, if you're on a timetable, <laughs> you don't have time for hit or miss. You crank it to 11 and you go. Uh, but, you know, they, they showed the one dude who, like, all of a sudden manifested a gun and started shooting people in the parking lot and then shot himself. Uh, which, you know, it, it, so it wasn't necessarily a suicide ray. No. It was just like a mayhem and death ray. <laughs> yeah, it was like but, they they put this pulse out or whatever it was, and whatever reaction happened, happened. You know, like... It could be different from one person to the next, how they would react to being exposed to this. Yeah, and it was just so – I mean, you'd think that you would just go – because because they had like the elimination ship or the eliminator, I think they called it. I, I look at it this way. If you are trying to convert energy, okay, you want to do it in the most direct way so that you don't lose it to – heat or other things you know you want to put in x amount of resources and get as much out of it as you can and that's how it's viable it's like why why cold or i'm sorry not cold fusion but why fusion doesn't necessarily work because at this point you put as much energy into it as you get out of it so it's it's a zero gain right why would you use a ray that may or may not cause some people to lose their minds and either A, kill themselves, or B, kill other people and then kill themselves. Why wouldn't you just have a ray <laughs> that you could, like, area of effect and just blast areas and just have it affect, uh, you know, organic material? You know, humans. I mean, they've obviously taken samples. If they're, like, a, a an advanced race, you'd think that they would be able to come up with something that would work faster. Yeah, it wasn't the most efficient thing in the world. No, it was. It was just. It was terrible. They've they've got all this awesome technology. The the League of Races kind of looked down, or not the League of Races. I'm sorry. The the Legion of the Winged Serpent looked down on the humans because they weren't they weren't worthy of the planet. Essentially, mm -hmm. uh, I mean that's really the overall feel I got. <clears throat> so why wouldn't you? Just get in there and do the thing and do it quick. Because by the, the end of the battle, you know, Christopher Lee looks at his watch and he's like, well, pfft, time's up. <laughs> you know, and the ship had just been blown up maybe 10 minutes before and the humans were still on the planet. So it's just like, you know, if you've got a timeline, you want to do the most direct way to get the job done than, you know, pussyfoot around and waiting for people to, you know, shoot each other yeah exactly. it just seemed really ridiculous yeah please subscribe to this galactic network podcast by going to gncast.com slash subscribe or search itunes stitcher google play music or anywhere podcasts are offered so that's going to do it for uh this review of starship invaders is that what it's called Yes. Right? Okay. That's going to do it for this review of the 1977 film starship invaders and uh, next week, next episode, I should say, we'll be discussing our top four favorite alien ships. Hoo -hoo. That's going to be a fun one. Yes. All right. So we'd like to thank Monkey Warhol for providing our intro music, the song Alien Syndrome. You can find more about him and his music at monkeywarhol.bandcamp.com. Also, too, Retward von Dürnberg, a composer from Germany, for our closing song called Be Water. Learn more about him and his music at thecaravel.net. Also, thanks to Mr. Ben Olson. Thanks, Ben. For recording our disclaimer audio at the start of this episode. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, final thought, Brad, just real quick. This movie was horrible. Don't waste your time. Okay. <laughs> Even though it's free and it's on YouTube. So. Yep. Okay. Don't, wa don't waste your time. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, we'll talk to you next time. Okay, bye. This has been a Galactic Network podcast. For more, go to GNCast.com. That's G-N-C-A-S-T-S dot com.